Hello and welcome back. It's been a while, so let's dive right into my progress on this project. As you could see in the beginning, I finally have a working 3D printed prototype. Now, most of the time was spent iterating the human machine interface, this thing with the buttons and LCD. The hard part was managing the 10 wires that come out of the boring head body. I think I would have gone insane if I had to solder all those wires directly to the human interface and then trying to not pinch them while I screw it down. So I went and designed a custom connector and PCB. On one side you have your buttons, they need to align with the 3D print so they sit firmly in it and the solder joints don't get stressed that much when this thing is taking a cut. On the other side, you need a means to interface with the main body and get your signals to the inside where all the electronics are. For this, I went with the pads, which will press against spring-loaded pins and make sure the signals get to the microcontroller. Then let's start making the PCB. I made PCBs before, but I made all of those on my CNC mill using a method called isolation milling. Here we trace the outline of the created circuit and isolate it from the rest of the copper area. The biggest issue with this is the spaces between the traces. Even when auto-leveling the PCB beforehand and using fresh engraving end mills, the same as the YouTube channel Rexter CNC, the gap is still way too big and I would like to keep everything as small as possible for this project because of the size of my hobby machines. But I will still use the CNC to drill all the holes and mill the shape so that the push buttons will locate precisely. One thing I have to mention is milling and drilling those PCBs. I see a lot of YouTubers doing this and it is a real health hazard. I'm also guilty of this and realized only now how much dust is in the air because the black camera and lights are now in front of the machine. So if you like to make PCBs in this way, you definitely need an enclosure or machine them underwater like I did. This should also increase the tool life. Now, how to create the traces on the PCB. For this, I went with UV sensitive foil and exposure masks. There are many other videos on this topic out there, so I'm making it quick. Take your foil and cut out a fitting piece. After that, use two strips of tape, put them on both sides and pull them apart. This foil has protective layers on both sides and we need to get rid of one. After that, we need an iron, so make sure your wife doesn't need it. Apply the side of the foil of which we just removed the protective layer from onto the PCB and make sure that there are no air bubbles. In this case, it is pretty easy because there are a lot of holes in the PCB. Tack your iron and laminate the foil onto the PCB. Be careful because if it gets too hot, the foil will wrinkle and you can start all over again. Under normal circumstances, the next step would be to take the exposure mask, put it on top of the PCB and expose it under UV light. But as I said in the beginning, there are certain restraints and on this side are pads which are going to interface with the pins and when those miss, it's not going to be a fun time. So I need a way to accurately position the exposure mask over the PCB. For that I used an old XY table of a microscope and with the help of a few 3D printed parts I have a crappy solution to this problem. Now I can tape the exposure mask to the XY axis and move it over the PCB and align it. The only thing left to do is to expose it and I would recommend not using cheap China LEDs. After this I take the PCB off of this horrible contraption and dissolve all the uncured resin. Make sure you get all of it off or the acid in the next step won't edge the copper away. As for acid, I use iron chloride free or something like that because I don't need to heat it up for it to start etching the copper away. Mm -hmm. 
after a lot of trial and error, which was quite hard because the exposure mask does not always sit flat on the PCB, so overexposure was a given, but I have at least one working PCB. When overexposing, the biggest issue is the spaces between certain traces. I had to manually scrape away cured resin to separate them, which is always fun. At this point we finally come to a more fun part, soldering everything together. I mean, it would be better if I don't suck at it. Disgusting! See, even past me agrees. Now to a new problem, the batteries. Yeah, I think those are not going to cut it. As mentioned in the first part, I was going to use those little cells which can provide 3 volts. In terms of capacity, let's just say they don't deliver much and the fact that all 4 are in series only makes it worse. The moment I connect them to the boring head, they instantly get drained quite hard and are not able to move the motor. So I think I will design a detachable battery and use one of those 9 volt block batteries. The only thing left to do now before I machine the main parts out of metal, is to make a little gear rack, so the motor can move the top part of the boring head. Alright, let's make some man glitter. As mentioned before, the main body will be out of steel, in this case it is called ST32 in Germany. I'm using carbide inserts for this because I can push harder without coolant than with high speed steel and the fact that my mill has a gear reduction for the main spindle means I can take a good depth of cut for this little machine. Oh, and make sure to clean up the bird nests. Can get really terrifying when a sharp and partially hot metal ball is spinning around. After I roughed out the main body, the next step would be to cut an inside thread to mate the body with a SK30 tool holder. I plan to make a practice cut in some aluminium, but as always, I am missing one change gear for this thread. Great. I made one already on my CNC, but that turned out not so great regarding the alignment when I had to flip it. So let's hope this will not happen again. Spoiler, it did happen again. Alright, roll the montage. Mont montage? Montage. I guess there went something wrong, aside from me making a 40 tooth gear instead of a 45, I think this is the end of this part. As always, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.